ادعو إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعدة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. When President Trump assumed office 10 days into his office in January 27th, 2017, he issued an expansive executive order with the expressed intent of excluding as many people from Muslim-majority countries as legally possible. Now, many people called it the Muslim ban because of the overwhelming evidence that it was designed not only as an anti-immigration policy, but also as an anti-Muslim policy driven by the zeal and the energy that has been created within this industry of Islamophobia and within the structure of U.S. laws that has allowed something like this to happen. I believe that we will! I believe that we will! I believe that we will win! As soon as this happened, we saw the rise of many, many Americans from all walks of life, group regular citizens, civil rights activists, lawyers, law enforcement, politicians, everybody flooded the airports, came to the rescue and support of Muslims who were coming into the United States, Muslim Americans who were returning back to their homeland, and they refused to acknowledge this executive order of Muslim banning Muslims and in fact took it up to courts and we have seen the successful arguments in court that put a ban on it and then we said we saw the struggle that has come forth with the modifications that have taken places and with the other courts taking them up <laughs> important for us as Muslim Americans to understand the depth and the nature of this challenge as not only a manifestation of racism and prejudice, but also as a structural component of what is wrong with our country and that the things that we need to understand at all levels to be able to remove this illness from the society at large. Islamophobia unfortunately has moved from the fringes into the mainstream. Our mosques are being targeted by vandals. And we must such develop a strategy that will change this anti-Islam social acceptability environment in America. We need to understand the nature of Islamophobia in the United States and its networks. We need to understand who's driving anti-Islam legislation. We need to stop those who are targeting students and who are introducing Islamophobic concepts in education. We need to fight against hate crimes and discrimination. We need to remove Islamophobic media and its access and we need to battle Islamophobic politics. There's so many manifestations that are worrisome and we need to advance Islam in its true form as a benefit to all of humanity and it's a beautiful message that inspires all of us as Muslim Americans with values and principles. We need to identify Islamophobia as identical to prejudice, that it is against the American ideals and we need to work on improving the media take on Islam and Muslims. We need to enhance the ability of our community to impact the political and the policy life through public service, through electoral politics, and through civic contribution. And as such, our fight against Islamophobia is our fight for America. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. Welcome to Perspectives. Today we will be talking about Islamophobia as an example of the challenges we have laid ahead of us and as a way in which we can live as Muslim Americans, our reality in America imbibed with the great values of our message in a way that allows us to fight those things that challenge the U.S. and challenge the soul of America in its ability to rid itself of racism and prejudice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the holy book says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal maw'idati al-hasana wajadilhum billati hiya ahsan and call to the way of your Lord with wisdom and the good example and argue not except that which is best. And so today as we discuss the issue of Islamophobia as a topic that exemplifies the challenge we are faced with 
in America, when we look at its ideals and founding principles and values, in America, the idea, and reflect on its prejudice and racist application, in America, the practice, and particularly as Muslim Americans inspired by a divine message that calls us to engage others with wisdom and righteousness in a matter that impacts us directly as Muslim Americans and in a matter that challenges America to its core as it violates the very principles it is founded on. It calls upon all faithful and justice-oriented citizens of this great nation to rise up and to challenge the evil and to eradicate the scourge of Islamophobia. Now, Muslim Americans will be in the forefront of ridding America of this illness, not just for the sake of the Muslim community, but for the sake of the greater America we're part of and for the sake of all Americans. So let's look at what can we define as Islamophobia. Islamophobia, if we were to define it, is that closed-minded prejudice against or a hatred of Islam and Muslims. Islamophobia is an exaggerated fear, hatred, and hostility towards Islam and Muslims that is perpetuated by negative stereotypes resulting in bias, discrimination, and the marginalization and the exclusion of Muslims from America's social, political, and civic life. So in some ways, it is another shade of racism because it uses the modern concept of race as a way to develop anti-Muslim prejudice. It can be considered a form of nativism, where we create these venues in which xenophobia becomes the dominant reaction of a large segment of our community. And where above all, and what's most important for us to understand, it is a structural problem within our society. It's no longer about Ignorance, it's no longer about just hate or even any forms of xenophobia, but rather it is a process by which now it's becoming part of the laws and in the policies of our nation. And that where the real challenge is for us to be able to change the structure that allows this to fester and continue as an illness that destroys our society from within. So the broader explanation or definition of what Islamophobia is, is that it's a contrived fear or prejudice fomented by the existing Eurocentric and Orientalist global power structure. It is directed at a perceived or even real Muslim threat through the maintenance and extension of existing disparities in economic, political, social, and cultural relations. All the, all the same while rationalizing the necessity to deploy violence as a tool to achieve civilizational rehab of the target communities, Muslim or otherwise. Islamophobia reintroduces and reaffirms a global racial structure through which resource distribution disparities are maintained and extended. These are definitions that tries to cover all the aspects of something like this. And it may be too complex for a short discussion, but it can be expanded upon. But the fact is that its impact at the end is something that stifles the ability of Muslim Americans to debate and present themselves. It prevents us from engaging public dialogue, and it causes an unfavorable view of Islam and Muslims in a nation that celebrates its plurality and diversity and it stifles the ability of part of the constituency of our citizens, the Muslim Americans namely, to speak, publish, or to be politically active. Now I want to talk about the different manifestations of this in a short way, but that we can expand on in the future. If we were to look at the structural aspects of Islamophobia within American society, we can see it in the issue of surveillance. We can see it in the issue of incarceration and policing. We can see it in the issue of immigration, registration, and travel. We can see it in the issue of extrajudicial designation. We can see it in the issues that are at the state and local levels. And we can see it in the issues that deal with rhetoric, training, and the media issues. And we can see it in a program that all of us know as CVE, Countering Violent Extremism, 
These are different shades of the problem that is existent within our society in the issue of Islamophobia. And so, for example, when we look at the issue of surveillance, when we saw what the New York Police Department did in the surveillance, we see a structural, systematic way of targeting Muslims. When we look at the results of that surveillance, when Muslims are being targeted for being a threat to our nation, we see that it has nothing to do with fighting terrorism. When we look at the FBI or the National Security Agency surveillance and its preponderance against the Muslim American community, we see no connection between a rise in terrorist activities and between any of these activities. When we see the practice of FBI informants destroying communities from within, yet resulting in no benefit to the safety of our nation. When we look at the incarceration and policing issue, we see the issue of entrapment that the police tactics have used. We see the use of secret evidence and material witnesses that has yielded nothing to keep us safer. We see the indefinite detentions and the lack of due process. All these are things that impact the well-being of our society and impacts the well-being of Muslim Americans. When we look at the issue of criminalizing free speech and the use of material support under those guys, we see an expansion of the police state, not saving our civil liberties and, and our freedoms, and so on and so forth. We look at the issue of immigration and we see how these laws that have been enacted, whether from 9-11 or even beyond, that has only helped to commit injustices against the immigrant community in the guise of national security. When we had the Nasir's program, the National Security Entry Exit Registration System, we saw a flawed system that had to be put out because it committed so many injustices. When we look at what's called CARP, C-A-R-R-P, the Controlled Application Review and Resolution Program, we see yet another faulty policy being implemented. And now we have this U.S. visit and visa waiver reciprocation, a program that's in effect today, but it has committed so many civil rights uh, um, problems with the community as well and resulted in things like random searches and so on and so forth. This whole idea of extrajudicial designations, you know, what they call the, the terrorist screening database, the no-fly list, those secondary security uh, screening selection list, if you've ever been on it, the SSSS, we used to joke with my children every time we get that designation when we go to airports until it was lifted more recently. But it was a system where, despite being a citizen of the United States for so many years, despite being a community activist and, and somebody who produces and, and works hard to serve the community, you're still labeled in a certain way, in a different way, my wife because of her hijab, my name because of who it is, and so on and so forth. These are things that have been inching away and breaking away our civil liberties and in the guise of Islamophobia. These interrogations at the borders or at the entry point and so on and so forth. We see a lot of practices at the state and local level where there is these supposed anti-Sharia legislations that are popping up in the name of restricting Muslims and we see difficulties in obtaining permits for our mosques or our Islamic schools. We see dress and uniform policies and employment, we see plenty of other things that we see. We see in Congress politicians that are daring to speak against Islam and Muslims without retribution and without even being able to stop from doing that. We see police training that are designed only to target Muslim Americans and those are part of a process that has been fed by this bias and this prejudice that is rampant within our system. And finally, we see the introduction of programs like CVE, Countering Violent Extremism, a way to surveillance our community and subject our, our freedom of speech and subject our freedoms guaranteed by the constitution of conscience and of ideas so that we can become a security basically subject for the authorities. It has been tried in the past against our African-American communities by the FBI and so on, and we saw its failure. Muslim Americans should not be viewed from the lens of security. We should not securitize our relationship with the government. We're full-fledged citizens of this nation, and we're owed our full rights. My dear brothers and sisters, what's now? The idea is once we recognize that Islamophobia is a phenomenon beyond being just lack of education or being just human 
hatred and xenophobia, but rather it's a structural problem that's plaguing our society, that is impacting our lives every single day. And that what we need to do is not just to renounce it or, or stand against it, but rather we need to organize and create coalitions and bring about the venues and changes that would allow the undoing of these evil policies that undermine our freedoms and erase our space of civil liberties. That's what this Islamophobia example presents. Everybody needs to learn about it. We need to develop the resilience and the resistance within our community. We need to de develop the coalitions and the relationships so that we can overcome this evil and so that we can move our nation forward. My dear brothers and sisters, this is a call for action. This is a call to get involved and this is the call, a call to do something about it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to bless all of us. I thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.